welcome everyone. Happy New Year. Happy 2022. Um, we're, I'm going to let Gerald, like, you know, uh, manage the, the folks trickling in. But if otherwise, we're going to jump straight into this. Um, so I am super excited to talk to Sergio Monsalve today, as many of you saw on the event calendar. Uh, he's the founding partner of Robo Ventures, and we're going to be talking about thematic investing and increasing diversity at the table. Roble Ventures is an early stage venture fund investing 500K to 3 million checks in founders who are building solutions in human enablement, which Sergio will, will do a much better job of clarifying in just a minute. Uh, Sergio has an incredible track record for investing in great companies since his days as a partner at Norwest Venture Partners, including the likes of unicorns like Kahoot, Udemy, and Adaptive Insights, a number of which he sat on the board of. He also co-founded Stanford's GSE's Entrepreneur in Residence program and is on the board of trustees at Harvey Mudd College, where he co-chairs the Entrepreneurial Initiatives Committee. Prior to venture, he held leadership positions at eBay, PayPal, and Portal Software. He's also a master swimmer and starts his day with an insane exercise routine at six in the morning. So props to you on that. New Year's resolutions here. Um, and, uh, and as you might guess, with such an illustrious background, he's got tons of war stories and we will run out of time before I run out of questions, but I will do my best to be a good steward of conversation, inspiration, and discovery. Sergio, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, David, and thanks for having me and thanks for uh, showing up and, uh, and uh, I, you know, I'm happy to talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. It's exciting to do to be able to share the stories, the war stories, as you call them. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we jump into war stories, I actually want to give a little preface here. For those of uh, who are unfamiliar with Roble, where does the name Roble come from? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a good beginning. Uh, I, it it kind of ties to a lot of things in my life. Uh, I, 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 you know, to, to tell this story properly, I'll just give you the the kind of the two second uh, background on me. Uh, I was born and raised in Mexico City, came to the US San Diego when I was 13, not knowing much English and, and not, uh, not really intending to go to, to the US for school. I uh, loved math and science. I didn't know there was such a thing as Silicon Valley back then. Uh, I was just a, a little immigrant in San Diego. And so one of the things that I, I ended up doing is I applied to a bunch of schools, colleges, uh, only in California, my parents wouldn't let me go farther than that because it's not one of those things that you do as, uh, as someone from Latin America. And, um, and so what I ended up, I was fortunate enough to, to get into Stanford. Uh, so the name of my freshman dorm was called Roble Hall, which happens to be the oldest dorm, the biggest, the one that admitted women first, the one that, uh, that created multicultural housing and that right now is the sustainable, sustainability center for Stanford. So not only, uh, not only it represents a lot, it represents the opening of the window to a new world called Silicon Valley for me and combining my love for STEM and technology with, with entrepreneurship, which is in my other love. It just, I found my home away from home here in, uh, in the center of epicenter Silicon Valley at Roble Hall. Uh, or Roble is also, for those of you who don't know, it's, it's oak in Spanish. So it's a very strong tree. Uh, and I think that that's, that resembles sort of how I, I want to build uh, Roble and the co portfolio companies that I invest in and what kind of services I provide. So it has a lot of meaning to me. That is beautiful. I did not know it came from Roble Hall, um, but now I have, there's a, there's a story behind here. And speaking of oaks for others, um, I did mention this in the introduction, and I said human enablement, which I believe is a mission that you guys have at Roble Ventures. What does human enablement exactly, what does it entail? What does it mean? Yeah, and so that, that also uh, is, is really uh, after many, many years of, of both being an entrepreneur and a venture investor, I've noticed, you know, you get to take a step back and look at sort of the, tr the chronology of, of this thing. I'm, I love history, even though I've been I've been, I've been an, an entrepreneur and been focused in technology and product and all of that stuff. Uh, I, I really love to sort of think of history and, and, and to, in order to predict the future, which is basically how we get paid as venture capitalists. Uh, so one of the things that I've noticed over time is that 
uh, that in Silicon Valley, we are very enamored with technology centric innovations. Uh, and oftentimes that has some side effects on human, but uh, on humans, uh, either positive or negative, hopefully mostly positive. But, you know, I, I, I really, over the last seven or eight years, I, I started investing in what I used to call future work, future learning. And I didn't really realize how much, uh, in how much entrepreneurs don't really end up focusing on human-centric technology, meaning putting the customer first and the, the human first, and the technology should aid that uh, development of that, that human enablement. So what I, what I mean by human enablement is really an extension of what I've done at Norwest, which is to invest in companies that really either are education tech companies or human capital management companies or companies essentially when I redefined it and I started Roble last year, I decided to really put a, a real term, which is to enable humans to get ahead, all humans to get ahead. So what I mean by that is that we are investing in application layer software, either enterprise or consumer in three buckets underneath the human enablement theme that it all, everything has to do with creating socioeconomic opportunity for people and broader set of people, not just the, the ones that are privileged uh, they have the right gender, the right ethnicity, but everybody to try to get ahead using technology. So in those three buckets, what, I, what I've what i added is uh, on one end, you have this quintessential glass ceiling that affects a lot of people that don't really look like your boss or don't really act like your boss. So the glass ceiling in corporations is a real thing. It's, it's essentially favoritism, nepotism. Uh, so what I wanna invest in there, and I have been investing there, is in companies that offer transparency and, uh, and really create a system so that you flatten the organization, you allow all, all voices to be heard and you create much more meritocracies, a better way to get promoted. Uh, it, it is less biased towards certain types of people. So that's one way to get ahead. The second one is what I call skills development, which is really what, what, kind, of, uh, what kind of things can you learn post-education, formal education, to continue your lifelong learning uh, journey so that you could actually get promoted, uh, get a better job, be more skilled, especially in a world that's moving so quickly, that an economy that's moving so fast that you can no longer study from five years old to 21 years old and be done studying, right? You can't just get a piece of paper and say, I'm done studying. You have to keep going until you're hundred and beyond, right? So that, that iterative learning is what I invest in in the second bucket and the third bucket is really platforms and, and marketplaces that create new types of jobs that are, are aspirational, like marketplaces. One of mine where I worked uh, when I was an operator was eBay. They created a lot of jobs for sellers uh, in the platform. And that was probably the first one that pioneered. But since then, we've had, we've had many, many, many. And I'm much, much more focused on platforms that create aspirational jobs, jobs that you could really make a, a, a big living out of not just delivering food or driving a car, which are fine, but what I really want to create is, is, is jobs that really can kind of get people really excited about a, a bigger opportunity that you want to aspire to. So for example, at Udemy, we've enabled a lot of instructors to make some of them over a million dollars a year teaching in the platform. And, and that's a new way to work. And that also enables humans because there's a different type of, uh, most a lot of people, I didn't know this when I was working at eBay, but a lot of people can't just work in a nine to five job. There's many limitations to it. So by allowing flexibility in how you work, uh, especially allowing uh, uh, income opportunities that are pretty aspirational, you essentially create new jobs. So human enablement is creating new jobs, creating new skills, and also creating uh, a fluid environment in the workplace. So you could get promoted if you work hard and you know what you're doing that you should. Uh, not have a glass ceiling, right? That is very fascinating. And I want to touch on a couple of things. Um, one of which, or I guess to start off with which, um, you mentioned that, you know, th there's, there's sort of a glass ceiling for a lot of folks in, in companies. And when you're investing at such an early stage, most founders, I assume, don't think about the upwards progression in their company. How do you tease, do you ask about those in the very beginning of their companies or, or is that something you 
you advise them on as they grow. Or, and if you do ask them questions at the beginning, like what kind of questions do you ask founders to get an understanding of how they think about human enablement within their company? Yeah, yeah, and that's a good point because when I think of human enablement, there's, there's one uh, aspect, which is what I described before, which is the types of companies that I invest in. But it's not just that. When I think of human enablement, it also looks introspectively into how I build the companies that I invest in or how I help the founders build those companies. So one of the things that I've noticed over time is that um, another, another thing that's happened in Silicon Valley is that sometimes we have very much the, the, board, the board composition of a company at a series C, A, B, C is always dictated by who funds them, right? So there's always an A director, a B director, a C director. It is not until you go public when you start in creating a much more independent board that has a, a wide variety of stakeholders in mind uh, in, in the beginnings uh, is very myopic towards the stakeholders that are biggest shareholders, which happen to be the preferred shareholders. So um, when I think of that, I thought of who, well, who are those venture capital board members that are getting in the board? And, and there's no surprise that there's no diversity and there's, no, uh, there's very little diversity. I mean, we're trying to change that but I, I do think that a company, my companies that I invest in, 80% of them are co-founded by women, a combination of women, men, founding teams. They're, some of them are founded by, all of them are founded by a diverse uh, founding team and a C-level team. And there's no surprise for that. Uh, I'm not surprised that that's happening because on my, my um, brand that Roble represents on human enablement, I want to help those companies build from the beginning a board that's diversely thinking, not necessarily, you don't have to be, you know, it's not about color of skin or gender, it's much more about diversity of thoughts. And so that often means that it, there is diversity of gender and ethnicity because you come from different perspectives. Um, so so, so uh, when I think of companies that I invest in, I don't only ask them about their product roadmap or their financial roadmap. Uh, I ask them about their human roadmap which is to your point, how do you create an organization that's a, whole, a culture of transparency and complete accountability, but also a good solid debate based on different perspectives that people bring, not just this groupthink situation that tends to happen in some boards, especially because of the nature of how VC is constructed, right? Right. I. I'm so curious on that side of things where you ask about the, the human kind of progression of, of, of everything, especially at the early stages in which you invest. Most boards, let's say they start off as three people, it's usually two founders and one investor, right? And as, as it slowly yep. goes from three to five and all that, how do you, when you're actually on the board, like how do you instruct them to think about diversity? Because sometimes you're like, oh, well, somebody's giving me a big check. They have a huge value add to the business. I kind of just want them on my board. Like, how do you check their blind side? How do you check founders blind sides for them? Yeah. You know, the one of the one thing that I, I'm, I, I invest both in the U S and internationally at least 30%. Uh, and in both situations, I think they look for me just to, uh, to, for advice on, because I'm thematic, I don't, I, I've reduced, my my focus on just those three themes that that fit under under uh, hu uh, human enablement, right? Mm -hmm. So what I I get the, the the luxury that I have now versus in the last fourteen years is that I get to just tune and prune the the network and condense the network so the density of people that I I have um, I, I am I can introduce to my founders is much more relevant to them to them. But because in the past there would be deals that would I would have to attend to that would be deals, for example, in semiconductors or, or in e-commerce for shoes. And then all of a sudden we're looking at education companies. And so that diversity just, I didn't have, I don't have the network to be able to, to kind of touch on, be able to uh, be valuable to all those types of sectors. But when you do reduce the focus to just your theme, obviously run the risk of picking the wrong theme. So that's, a, that's an issue, but on the positive side, you condense your network. So what people come to me for is that I can introduce them to the most relevant person in their industry because I've met them, right? And, and so ideally, uh, because you have a, a very discreet sort of world that you live in, you are, you're much more relevant to those players that, that, are, that, are, that are your um, entrepreneurs. 
So they come to me for advice, but part of the advice that I also give is that it's very important. I give them sort of war stories to your, to your earlier point. Uh, I give them the war stories of how mistakes were made because of, of uh, the beginnings of forming your board and the beginnings of boarding your, uh, forming your C-level. Almost all of my uh, uh, negative outcomes or learning uh, experiences <laughs> are due to that specific issue is that we, uh, from the beginning, didn't create the proper uh, team environment and the proper, proper collaborative environment, either at the board level or the executive team level. And that, that's, I think, where I helped the most initially. Uh, and and also obviously on go to market, that's the other, other piece. Interesting. I, this, this next question is going to be me scratching my own itch here. Um, and so how do you think about giving advice to founders? Because obviously, like everyone, advice is free. And you can get advice pretty cheaply across, right? You can ask your mom for advice. You can ask your, your investor first. You can ask your co-founders for advice and all. Um, how do you think about giving advice? Because, and the reason I ask that is because um, Hunter Walk from Homebrew has this great quote, and I'm going to paraphrase here because I don't remember exact words, but if you... If you uh, sometimes listen to your investor's advice, uh, you might fail. But if you always listen to your investor's advice, you will fail. Um, and so how do you think about um, balancing anecdotal advice with the situational circumstances of where the founders are at? Yeah, and so that's a super interesting point because I, I'm dealing with uh, situations right now where they listen to me too much. And, uh, and, and they're asking me questions that are very, uh, they're very detailed to things that, that frankly, I shouldn't be advising on. So uh, the, the, what I try to do that it, what I try to do is be very, number one is you have to be very introspective and know when, when you need to tell a founder uh, that they need to seek other advice as well so that they can get a broader set. So I, I, what I try to do is give them a recipe. If I were in their shoes, this is what I would do but I, I try not to give them the answer necessarily. Ideally, I told this to a founder the other day as my, my role is to help you, uh, help you learn how to fish, uh, but I can't give you the fish. So the advice that I give you is not necessarily, it shouldn't be a fish. It should be the advice of how to learn how to fish, uh, if that makes sense. So, um, so oftentimes it comes in the in the, in the, if they ask me, well, how should I, uh, the other day I got a question on the board saying, how should I organize my uh, sales force? Because I'm building out the sales force and we're talking about hunters versus gatherers, uh, talking about customer success versus uh, inbound sales, uh, you know, out, uh, outbound sales, inbound sales. Uh, and so I said, listen, I think I have the person, perfect person, multiple people. You should talk to at least a couple of people that have been in this situation, I've seen, things to avoid in that role, but I, I certainly cannot, uh, cannot tell you. I can see, I can tell you what I've seen, but until you talk to those people, it will be highly anecdotal. Even, even when you talk to them, it will be anecdotal, but also I don't want them to be talking to a thousand people and creating a research dissertation uh, because then all of a sudden the, 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 the advantages of a company at that stage, which is speed, uh, they lose, right? So I think that's a really keen balance. Uh, so a lot of my founders need to kind of apply their judgment on how, how they're going to listen to their advisors. But at least my advice doesn't come with, this is the answer. It comes with, this is maybe the things that I would do to find the answer, I guess. Gotcha, gotcha. And I'm curious on the flip side of the scale. You have, you've talked about founders who listen to you too much. What about the flip side where founders don't, I assume there, there's a handful where they don't listen to you at all. They listen to you very little, but you feel like you have a good pulse of where the, they're, they're missing or where they should be going. Like, how do you, how do you balance that? How do you have those yeah, conversations? See the, this, is, uh, this is a great skill. Um, so if, if either if I, I'm on the board or not on the board, uh, it doesn't matter. I think, I think this is where... Um, we're having uh, a healthy debate among the board members that do influence. I mean, at the end of the day, the collection of, of let's say you have five board members are indeed the accountability source for the CEO, right? So, uh, so there's no, uh, the CEO doesn't have a boss per se, but if there was a boss, it would be the board because they're the only ones that can hire, fire and, 
and essentially makes uh, changes like that. So, so for all practical purposes, the 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 buck stops with the CEO, and then the board is where the the once the CEO is hired, the board is the one responsible for making sure that the CEO is doing the right job. So, what I try to do based on that construct, this is why it's so super important to have a board has the proper debates, has the has the proper um, transparency. They don't have hidden agendas. Uh, they have the proper culture of transparency and accountability because uh, when a founder doesn't listen to one specific person, the right thing to do is to just make sure that everybody kind of hears all their points if there's one big decision to be made. Oftentimes it comes like, for example, should we sell the company or should we not? Those are black and white decisions. And so that's when, that's when a debate among the board members needs to be completely transparent it has to be, in, as a board member, you have to have two hats. Remember that. You're representing whatever ownership you have as your fund, uh, which is the, your, your stake in the company. But you also should be representing the full set of stakeholders, including uh, what Mark Benioff would call, like, a, well, I don't know if you call it this, but it's a, he thinks of his, his role as, as having his stakeholders not only be in the building, employees, customers, uh, they, they have to include the community. So a real 360 view of who you're representing. And so the board needs to kind of think of all the collateral damage and uh, not collateral, hopefully not com collateral damage, but all the, all the um, side effects that come with a decision that you make that include all those stakeholders. So, uh, so I, I, think, I think it's important as a board member to have those two hats, but also it's important to have the proper debate on the board so that when the message goes to the CEO, it should be delivered by one person with the force of the full board uh, because the board has debated it thoroughly. And, and, and so that you get the best answer. You don't confuse the CEO with multiple messages. That's what tends to happen when you have too many uh, board members around and, and they're giving them uh, completely, completely conflicting advice to the CEO because the, the CEO all of a sudden gets gets uh, different messages and says, I'm just gonna do what I think it's right. Uh, so that, that tends to happen too. Too many cooks in the kitchen sometimes, right? Yeah, um, yeah, it could be. And so I wanna take a step back for a second. Right now we've, we've talked a lot about um, how founders need to think about building diverse boards, how founders need to like think about taking advice because the, the vast majority of the people on this call happen to be investors and sit on the investing side of the table, I'm curious because you've been very active in, in constructing diverse boards, both from the early stage and, and to the late stage, um, what are questions VCs or angel investors or any kind of investors, what should they be asking themselves to be more aware of their own implicit cognitive biases around diversity? Uh, well, um, I think there's, there's, uh, there, there's no better way to, uh, to try to test out your biases than to actually try to uh, uh, collaborate with people that you consider to be different in different dimension, uh, different than you in different dimensions, right? So I think uh, a lot of people talk about ethni ethnicity and gender as the big differences or maybe sexual orientation. I think there's a lot more than that. There's, for example, there's an age bias uh, that you could have uh, generational bias, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think there's, uh, there's, um, uh, you know, there, there could be a functional bias because some people in the board are, tend to ask a lot of questions about technology because that's what they know versus marketing versus sales. So there's a lot of biases that are, that are so multidimensional. So the best thing you could do is to, is to avoid what we, unfortunately, in many cases in society, we're trying to kind of cocoon ourselves to things that are kind of agree with us, right? Do the opposite. I think I would try to extend the hand to people that, that potentially disagree with us that you'd respect and they're, that, are, that are bright individuals, but they are thinking differently than you. I think that's probably the best way to, to put the reps in and to, uh, to exercise those muscles that allow you to kind of see things from other people's perspective. So I teach a class at Stanford on this specific topic of, of venture capital due diligence, uh, and some of that, some of those topics are about bias reduction, and and exactly we talk about that. Is and the one the first lesson that I teach is about 
how do you get inside your customer's shoes and live in them and walk in them? So essentially exercising your empathy muscles uh, in, in, in an environment where you're creating a new startup for a set of customers, right? That's a, different, that's a different use case, but it could be the same use case when you're trying to gain empathy from people you work with. You want to try to listen to their narrative to try to put them, yourself in their shoes and hopefully that you can understand that. And, uh, and that's, I think that's great, a great skill that I'm still ways away from learning fully at all, but, but I, I've been starting to do it, you know, cause I think, I think my, my own feeds and social media are very much biasing me to, towards what I like. And I'm trying to kind of pull away from that and say, okay, let me question those things. And let me talk to people that are, that are not in my feeds that are not in my political spectrum and that are not in my, in the same generational, same gender. And so that, that tends to open you up a little bit and give you, give you a, a quintessential cosmopolitan view and, and a balanced view, I think. At least that's one exercise. That is incredible. I'm, I'm curious, I want the play-by-play uh, the -play here where, like, as, as you talk to diverse individuals uh, around gender, age, whatever it is, like diversity of thought, right? How do you go about constructing the, that, that group of people you, you talk with or, or hang out with? Where do you go to find this group of people that can help you engage in, I guess you could call creative conflict? Um, how do you think yep. about doing that? Yeah, so I've done it in many ways, uh, in many different ways. I mean, the, the, the nature of venture capital is that. It's a very open and fluid uh, profession that, it, that we're all lucky to to be part of uh, either as an entrepreneur or as a venture capitalist, but you have a lot of freedom. I mean, it, I, I worry more about people that are kind of stuck in, a, in, in sort of in the box. Uh, so you can do it in many ways. I mean, I think uh, in my case, uh, I, think, I think in all, all those dimensions, uh, for example, I work a lot. I decided to, in my, in my organization, uh, all my uh, all my partners, and I have all kinds of partners from tax, audit, legal, fund administration, uh, my associates. Um, I purposely try to create uh, what I what I spouse in my companies a complete diversity. So uh, there's there's at least two or three people uh, bl black, uh, Latino, women. Uh, over eighty percent of my uh, like I said my. My uh, co-founding teams are either are combination of women, men. So I try to do that, uh, but I also I also try to understand different uh, generations. I mean, teaching at Stanford, for example, is a really great way to be have the pulse of of uh, Gen Z uh, generation to try to really understand what's happening there, right? Uh, so so I think that there's you got to kind of seek out your um, get outside your comfort zone, I guess, is, is, is kind of the best way to put it. It's a hard thing to do, um, but extremely yeah. powerful um, if, if you get it right. Um, so I want to I wanna like zoom back in something and go back down uh, memory lane. Um, back in 07, um, possibly even prior to that, um, given the topic of this talk is like fanatic investments as well, what was your, do you remember your first ever investment? Um, and um, how did that shape the way you think about investments at large? How, how instructive was, was your first investment? It was, uh, I, I'd say that my first two, three years uh, as an investor were, uh, were pretty tragic. Uh, I was making all kinds of mistakes. Not only that, but we had, we had a little thing called the financial crisis come to us. So it kind of shut things down for a bit. Because we we didn't even know if we were, we were going to have an economy back then in 2010, I guess it was or nine. Um, so when I first started, I had a, a year or two of exuberance and then a year or two of complete uh, scarcity. So I got to see those two things in in full full display. Um, and and I I actually think that that's one thing that we're missing in the new set of investors. If you started investing post 2010 or 11, so you've been investing for 10 years, you could be investing for 10 years and have yet to see what it looks like to be in a situation where uh, 2008 or uh, 2009 or 2001 for that matter, right? 
So, uh, so I think that those are hist history lessons are more important now than, than ever. Um, I, I make, made all kinds of mistakes, uh, like I said. So I'd say the first couple of deals uh, were super instructional to me. I, I was very much beat up that they didn't turn out to be the way they wanted, I wanted them to turn out. But uh, the way I think about it is, I'll give you two examples. One, I made an investment in a company that we triple pivoted, uh, hired a, a, a founding CEO for that company uh, who did an amazing job on her third pivot, we were able to sell it back to uh, sell it to Google for basically for a little tiny profit. So it wasn't really worth it to be have invested in the company for three, four years and, and having uh, basically gotten your money back. But what happened is 10 years later, the CEO not only became an investor in my fund, but I invested in her new startup. And I'm incredibly, uh, incredibly happy with what she's doing. Uh, and, the, and the type of human enablement company that she's building. So I learned a lot from her and, and hopefully she learned a little from me, but more importantly, we still, we went to war together and she still doesn't hate me. So, uh, and we work together. So that to me is, is a win, even though it wasn't a financial win. The other one is uh, I, my first ever education tech investment didn't pan out. And it was also around that time, it was one of my first investments. And I know that I was super excited because the company initially showed some promise, but then it cratered massively. So it was, it was more of a surprise because I always thought, hey, once, once the company is going, it's up and to the right and you're ready to go. But, it, but uh, I, it's not the case. Every single company has, uh, has potential death traps along the way. So that was a learning lesson for me. But the more important thing is that I started in that, I invested in that company with a thesis mindset that education, uh, when I first invested in education, people were telling me, you're gonna, the fastest way to lose money in venture capital is you should, and you invest in education. That's been the death trap for a lot of players for a long time. And I said, you know, that might be the case, uh, but there's one little wrinkle there. I do think that it, given the economy is moving so quickly, humans cannot stop learning at 21 years old or 18 years old. Like that's impossible. You can't just take, go to, go to uh, primary school, secondary school, high school, college, and be done with a professional learning or formal learning. So there's gotta be a way for us to uh, learn from 21 to hundred, right? Like they, there's, there's no industry that exists. And so that's how, what led me to that first investment. Uh, so like I, I sort of was looking into education but what really galvanized that is when I really solidified that theme. And then I started looking at, at all the players in 2013. And that's what led me to this company, which, which uh, I sat on the board for seven years. And as of three, four months ago, we took a public for three, three four billion dollars, uh, which was due to me. Uh, so, and that is the, the epicenter, that Coursera, Pearl site, LinkedIn uh, learning, are all sort of the epicenter of lifelong learning now. And that's, now it's, it's kind of understood that every company should offer learning as part of their, their, their perks to their employees, including 401ks and health plans, you should offer education. So, uh, so I think uh, that's, that's, that's been validated. That theme has been validated. And, uh, and so I, I think uh, the first investment that I made, luckily I didn't run away from the theme but I but I didn't make money on the first one, right? But the second one more than paid for any others, so it's good. Gotcha. Um, this is going to be my uh, let's say last question before I turn it over to our fellows here, um, so then they can ask questions. Um, but uh, in the theme of the last question, I, I'm curious, rewinding back to when you first came up with the education thesis that you had, right? Your first investment didn't pan out. What gave you the conviction to hold on to that thesis and not w uh, walk the other way? Like, did you anchor yourself in any data points that you saw that you think other people underestimated? Like, what, what, what made you stay the course? Yeah, you know, and, and this is the way I think, this is why I like thematic uh, investing a lot more because, because I, always, I always like love to think about like, th like uh, things like, uh, what should the world look like in 10 years or 15 years? I, I love investing in stocks, for example. That's another one of my hobbies. So I guess I'm 
I'm pretty uh, boring that way. I invest in publics and my hobbies and privates in my professional life, but I just love looking at the future and predicting the future. And one of the things that I really, really love is, is just to imagine if, like start these sentences, like imagine if. And so one of the things I asked myself, that was first principles, you gotta go from first principles and say, okay, imagine if like the world of, 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 of jobs moves so quickly. And I started seeing it with some of my friends. Uh, some of my friends that I played poker with, like uh, said, they were, they were foundational in the semi, their parents or, or maybe they were a little older and they were foundational in the beginnings of Silicon Valley, which is the semiconductor industry. And so mm -hmm. I, I started seeing how that layer, which is much deeper layer than we now operate in. Uh, well, I guess semiconductors are cool again with NVIDIA and all those AMD, but in, in driverless cars. And, but, but back then, semiconductors were known to be kind of, we're done. Intel's done. Everybody's done. We got the PC. We got the, mo like the mobile wasn't there yet. But a lot of my, my friends couldn't get new jobs because the semiconductor industry was kind of pretty dormant. And they couldn't move to a higher layer. They couldn't go to the systems. They couldn't go into application layer. They wanted to work at Salesforce and couldn't get a job. So I, I started sort of seeing their pain. And they were highly qualified people. They were engineers that had, had studied in some of the best universities. And so I said, you know, there's, th this is where something needs to happen for these great brains to be retrained for the next layer up. Because technology is moving so quickly now that you could be obsoleted so quickly. So I started noticing that. So I said, imagine if you studied from five years old and 21 years old, but then you didn't stop. Like you continue to study until hundred years old. Like what would that look like? And that, that wasn't gonna be answered by Stanford or Harvard, MIT. Like there was no answer for them. They could have a little bit of like executive coaching, executive ed education here and there, mainly for business people, but they weren't gonna address it for the whole population. So you needed to use education and technologies and new new systems to do it and that's i thought i was convinced that there should be a university for the rest of your life and and so i didn't know what it would look like but that's why i kept looking right because it, it it needed to exist and now we're well on our way to creating that we're still on I, in my mind we're in inning two perhaps but but uh but there's a lot way to go there's a lot more especially with ai and and the metaverse that's going to drive us to be incredibly fast learning individuals and, and adaptable individuals. And ultimately that's what we need. Otherwise we're gonna get obsoleted so quickly. That is true. I mean, things are changing so fast. The jobs that we had yesterday will not be the jobs we have tomorrow, and not even today. Um, and the jobs that we have today will not exist tomorrow. And um, that is a very interesting uh, part to it as well. Um, but I do wanna open it up the floor to our fellows right now. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to come off mute, feel free to raise your hand, feel free to type into chat what your questions are. Um, and I, I, I did notice Gerald's question, but I believe um, Sergio did answer it. But if Gerald, you have something yet to add on to that, like go for it. We'll, we'll, give, we'll give people like a couple, oh, somebody cleared their throat. I did. That was you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay I'll, I'll ask one more question uh, as people are warming up their questions. Um, I had the fortune to talk to one of your classmates. I won't name who, but I'll, I'll, like, if you're curious, I'll, I'll share with you offline. Um, and uh, she um, ha had a question for you. As a busy professional, how do you continue learning and balancing work and family and friends? Because as we said at the beginning of the introduction, you do a lot of things. You're really busy. Like, how do you balance everything? Um, yeah, I think I think with COVID, it's been hard, uh, but it's also been easier because I don't travel as much, and that that took a lot of my time. So I really enjoy just popping into new worlds, Singapore, Bay Area. I mean, I don't know where else. Everybody else, I see maybe New York. There, uh, there's. It's great to kind of connect with a lot of people. Um, I think I think balancing is is tough. I, I I think sleep is probably the thing that gives in a little bit. And and like I like you and I talked about David. I, I kind of November December I kind of gave up on working out and being healthy. So I'm kind of bringing that back. 
I, I think what drives me is just curiosity, right? Uh, it's just I, I love I. You know, I was talking to my my daughter the other day, and she said she said uh, you Gen X uh, X Y Z like something der derogatory, right? And I said, listen, I am not a Gen Xer. I'm a I'm a I'm a generationally fluid person, and 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 so that kind of stuck with me because I do think of myself as wanting to spend time with all generations. Like tomorrow I'm spending time with my 80 year old dad and mom. And uh, two days ago, I was spending time with a 21 year old uh, sophomore or a, a, I guess a junior at Stanford. And I, I really love that about my job uh, in, in about, you know, just spanning the different sort of issues that people have and just kind of listening and learning. And, uh, but still that, that just, the only way I can tell you that I balance things is, is I did, I, I do cut out some things. Like when I started Roble, I was liberated by the fact that I couldn't, I, I didn't have to do, um, uh, um, I didn't have to do uh, uh, multi, uh, multi-sector studies or multi-sector analyses or, um, or multi-stage analyses, even though I love all stages of creating a company all the way to the IPO. Uh, I think that the fact that I'm early stage and very focused on this theme, it gives me a little bit more of a of grounding of being able to kind of focus, right? And not, not sort of uh, boil the ocean. And so that, that does help because that also helps my entrepreneurs by actually being more focused on what, how I can be relevant to them. Wow. Um, I actually have something on to, to add on to that. So if anyone has a question, I'm sorry, I'm going to steal the thunder a little longer, um, but I'm, I promise I'm going to hand it over to everyone. Um, you were a board member at Udemy for seven years. That amount of time, as far as I know, is rather uncommon for a board member because these days, like, you know, I, I see board members that have like 10 years of two to three years before they, they cycle out and they, they, they bring in fresh blood for the board as well. Um, how, how did you think about staying in the board as you, as you scaled across? Like from, from Udemy when they were an early stage startup to obviously the day of their IPO, um, how did you think about like refreshing your advice or, or insights that you were giving um, the founders? Yeah, see that, that I think that's a, a big flaw in the venture system is that, that because the cap table is pretty because the cap table is relatively uh, stagnant. Uh, so once you buy into your 15, 20% ownership, uh, you get a board seat and you, you do it by contract. So the, the A, Series A, the Series B, the Series C, all sort of let a deal, put a lot of money, got a lot of ownership and sort of get their, their board, board seat for life until there's change of ownership, right? Either an M&A activity or, or there's an IPO and all of a sudden, you start dil uh, diluting the ownership to other public owners. So I think I think uh, the fact that most companies take longer and Udemy is no exception. It took it took many many uh, iterations and and reinventions of the of the of the product and creating a new product that happens to be our crown jewel now and and and, and uh, uh, ch management changes. Uh, it took longer than I I anticipated to for it to be a public company. But because there's no, there's no necessity to change out the, the board members because the board members are the shareholders, then all of a sudden those stay. And you're right. I mean, we, we change out CEOs and, and management team and VPs and all that uh, a lot more than we change out the board members. I think there should be a better system where you kind of bring fresh, fresh perspectives depending on the stage, depending on the challenges of the company. Uh, and so I think I think there's a better way to do it, uh, but but the way venture has been created is all around who who led the deal and who knows the company the best from the beginning, uh, and that oftentimes is not the best case. In our case, um, in in our in our case, I hope that I was valuable throughout the different uh, stages uh, of the company, but it did you know I wasn't expecting to be on that board for for six and a half years. Uh, I would have. I would have been really happy to have taken it public a little earlier, uh, but you know it is what it is, right? It's it's it, companies take time, and I think the company's a huge success, and the the management team has done 
an immensely good job, and in, including the old management team and the and the founder and and the and the co-investors have done a really good job with that company. So I'm I'm thrilled with the outcome. Uh, but you know, like everything else, it takes a little longer. That's fair. Um, as they as as Mike Tyson says, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> yeah, I think Gerald has a question here, so I'm gonna hand off the reins to to Gerald. Yeah, I'm curious to know um, what other themes are you? I mean, do you? I mean, if you are running another fund, what other themes would you invest in, or even in your current fund? Like, what are the things that you're excited about? Like in this next, I would say five ten years. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I underneath the human enablement, we have three buckets, right? And so, so those are like areas of focus. And in each of those, there's there's sub themes that I I'm pursuing, which is the what I described the imagine if. Uh, scenarios. So I have a bunch of a, a list that I'm pursuing. Out of that, you create a market map of existing influencers and uh, and companies uh, and entrepreneurs and influ and, and, and thought leaders that are kind of talking about that. So so I'll give you a few examples. Um, in the skills development area, I I'm thinking about a, this thing uh, where. I'm looking in history about how uh, the college system in the U.S. was created and how they needed to be almost like like Apple. Remember Apple and, the, and they, when they created the Mac, they had to be fully integrated, complete full stack, create their own everything, right? Including their own mouse, their own uh, screen, their own CPU, everything. You know, it's like a one-stop shop, right? But as you become more specialized, you have best of breed solutions and you tie them all together. Well, the college system in the U.S. is not done that they're essentially when you think of the of the biggest universities not even not so big universities they're essentially a full city like they have they run a hotel called a dormitory they run a restaurant called a cafeteria they run a, a lab which is basically your your research centers and all that they run uh, a sporting events company like a live nation uh, they so you could all you could sort of think of the theme as unbundling a university what would you do to unbundle a university and how would it work and what would what would be missing from the experience because the best thing about a university is that it's a community but how do you not lose the community not lose the camaraderie but you actually create a best of breed solution that is just as high quality as as some of the universities without having to have why in the heck are is is like a harvard managing a dorm in a cafeteria they're not specialists in hotels and food service right like makes no sense so they're specialists at, at research right they're especially hopefully at teaching uh so I, I think there's something to be to be rebuilt there and that that would mean major disruption to to higher ed uh in many ways uh and and so i'm thinking about how to how to think about that uh, but that's one imagine there right that's one example but I, I have a I have a bunch um, I have a bunch that I'm kind of working through to kind of solidify and then I've also have investments that I've already made against some of those other theses that I have um, that that are the sub thesis underneath everything that I've described all right that's helpful How, I mean I, I know Faye has a question but I guess like an add-on to that is that's more like the investment side of it but how i guess like do you have any themes that uh you look at in terms of like the vc industry like how will it affect you being competitive or or like the, oh the, got it. yeah i guess the other angle is well. i'm curious to know about that yeah 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 so so uh i'll i, I don't know if this answers your question so you're talking more about competitive strategy against winning deals and having deal flow and all of that stuff. So the whole funnel, top of funnel, all the way yeah. through to winning, like getting in front of the biggest future unicorns of 10 years, for, uh, yeah. making sure that you're you're the guy that funds them, right? In your theme, yeah. obviously. Yeah, also, in addition to that, also like how do you see the VC industry changing over the next five to 10 years where maybe, maybe there's more emerging managers, maybe there's consolidation or, or any like high policies that you have? Yeah, so, so look, uh, I think VC is no different than uh, at the very core is a financial services industry, right? Uh, so, so for financial services industry, so it's services and we offer financials, financial products, right? Essentially money. Uh, so you look at our, 
older brothers and sisters, uh, which include the industry of commercial banking, investment banking. Uh, you, you talk about mortgage banking. You, you, know, you talk about uh, uh, private equity, growth equity, uh, you know, all those, all those either uh, proprietary or services around the banking industry, right? Lending, all that stuff. When you look at all those industries that are much older than venture capital, much more mature and less fragmented, uh, that's there's a reason for that. When when you look at all of those industries, they started pretty fragmented, and most industries sort of explode and become pretty fragmented. But over time, they consolidate. Uh, but they consolidate at, at I, what I've seen, especially in investment banking, as you see uh, three or four bulge bracket firms, and then you see a lot of really high powered boutiques. Uh, but you don't see generalists in the middle. You no longer see, I mean, you, you can count a lot of banks, uh, investment banks that have gone under that are kind of were caught in the middle. Uh, so you have JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, uh, maybe Citibank, maybe a few others. But then you have a bunch of really high quality boutiques uh, that are doing an incredible job around the specialty. I'm, the VC is not going to be any different. There's going to be obviously the huge capital allocators when the biggest endowments like like the Yales and Princeton's of the world and Harvard's and Stanford's will actually put a lot of money to work through the Sequoias and Andreessen Horowitz. And they they have a lot of ability to kind of put a lot of capital to work because they have a lot of products. Um, but there, there's the, the, if you want also high returns, you also go with the specialists, the boutiques that have a unique angle to VC. Uh, and in my case, I mean, I, 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 I talked about my theme, right, where I've generated le legitimacy through the investments over many, many years. But I also think that the next generation of entrepreneurs are going to be much different than the last generation. The last generation was mostly male, white. Uh, in the future, you're going to have a lot more women, a lot more minorities, especially given how much effort the universities in the U.S. have put into first gen. Uh, into diversifying their own their own um, student base, so I think that's going to come to fruition pretty quickly, uh, and I think I'm there to catch them, especially when it comes to people that represent at least 30 percent of the population in California, which is the Latino community and women and and others that feel like they're the underdogs in entrepreneurship. So that's that's my angle, and I think it's sustainable because right now a third of my meetings are happening in Spanish. And I wasn't expecting that, right? It's it's pretty astounding that a lot of people kind of relate right away and trust somebody just because they can say hi to you in a specific language. So it's it's good. I think it opens up the world. Uh, but that, I think those are the two things: a different type of entrepreneur that that the current world of VC is not able to address that that authentically, and then two is that the world's going to bifurcate, uh, and we're already seeing that uh, happen right now. Does that make sense? Yep. I love it. I love it. I think Faye also has a question. So if you want to come off mute, Faye, uh, feel free to like ask your question. Um, if not, I'm happy to read it as well. Oh, uh, uh, should I read it? Oh, uh, I think she's, I think she turned on her video for a sec. Okay. If, if not, I'll, I'll just read the question. Uh, Faye, feel free to jump in and stop me if you want to read it. Um, so Faye asks, do you experience labor shortage in your portfolio companies? Sorry if I missed. Um, do you think if and how promote, promoting diversity in the workforce can help shape competitive landscape going forward for companies? Uh, so two questions, there's two questions. Yeah, the labor shortages are happening everywhere. Uh, and I do think that the more uh, the more diversity, the companies that I've had that like have a, a, a better uh, approach to inclusivity and diversity uh, have a broader pipeline to draw from. So they're not just kind of narrow minded on just recruiting from one school or one type of uh, major. So I think I think that there is an opening of the pipeline in terms of shortage if you have an open mind about who you want to hire. Uh, and I've seen it myself too, and my the interns and associates that I'm hiring. I'm baffled by the, the 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 incredible quality that I'm able to get. Uh, that I'm I'm under the radar compared to all the other folks and venture that are hiring, and I'm able to hire some great people. 
uh, that I, actually I couldn't hire in the past. So it's, it's been great. Um, the, and, and so that actually that kind of answers the second question, which is, I think the competitive landscape, uh, competitive landscape on recruiting and retention. So if you think of uh, re recruiting your employee, but also retaining your employee and making them happy and be a good place to work, that whole cycle of an employee life cycle, the employee life cycle gets improved when they, they have one, they have two things, trust and belonging, right? So in belonging is so important and something we're missing with uh, just being online all the time, we're depleting our sort of social uh, data, uh, our social piggy bank. Um, so I, I think it's very important to belong to a group, a team, feel like you're doing it for the team, feel like you're, you have a, a goal in mind. It's almost like a, a sports team, right? You, you want to feel the energy of the crowd. And so uh, in order to belong and in order to feel the trust and, and that you're, you're sort of making a difference, you need to have a good purpose, but you also have to have, to have a company that includes a lot of people, right? That, that is, it fosters that open debate when there's no idea, the best idea is the one that floats to the top, not the one that came from somebody that, that happens to be uh, friends with the boss, right? So that's, that to me is two examples, or I guess a few examples of, of uh, how you can increase your competitive advantage when it comes to hiring and also to retaining great talent, which I think was the nature of the question a little bit, right? I think so as well. I think so. Um, but I know we're at the top of the hour here. Um, Diego has one more question. Just for the sake of time, I'm just going to read the question. Are you investing in Latin region? Um, yeah, absolutely. Did... Yeah. Yeah, that's Perfect. one thing I really, really, really uh, needed to do. I mean, I, I couldn't do that in my last 14 years, and I had to do that in my in this role. So I made a, a purpose of uh, 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 basically a no concession that I had to invest internationally, especially in LATAM, because uh, we, I have a competitive advantage there. Uh, and I can help a lot of the entrepreneurs there uh, access capital and know-how in Silicon Valley. There's very few of us here in, that have grown, grown up here, but are from there. And so to me, the benefit is that I can bring a lot of the entrepreneurs from Colombia, Chile, uh, Mexico, uh, Brazil, Argentina, to uh, access a global uh, know-how that comes to this type of the world, right? Right, right. Um, so I think we're at the, uh, that, that's incredible. And just for context, like, uh, Diego is one of our fellows and I believe he actively looks for investments in, in the Latin region as well. So your answer is very in tune uh, with that. So um, we're- Yeah, we're... so uh, I was gonna say along those lines, if any of you wanna connect with me on LinkedIn, just look me up and then we can continue the discussion or meet up if there's anything pertinent uh, to talk about. But it's been awesome to get to know you guys. And, and if, if there are other people that didn't show up but saw the, see the video, uh, let them know to connect with me. That'd be great. Sounds great. I mean- And connect with Roble too. Connect <laughs> we with need Roble. all the followers. We're, connect with we're Sergio. Lacking followers. <laughs> there we go, there we go. Um, but thank you so much. Uh, you read literally read my mind for my last question I was going to ask you, like, where can people find you? LinkedIn is the best way. Uh, follow Sergio and Roble on Twitter as well. Um, they have some incredible content out there. So I highly recommend that as well. Um, but uh, all in all, thank you so much for coming out this, this Thursday night. Hopefully you learned a lot. Feel free to reach out to Sergio and Roble. They are absolutely incredible souls. Um, so with that said, take care, everyone. Happy New Year. Happy 2022. And, and stay awesome out there. Thank you.